Thank you very much. So everybody in the world wants to have their own Silicon Valley. Um, and very few succeed. And there's a great deal spoken about why, what are the factors that require you, uh, that you have to have in order for that critical mass of technology, education, investment, capital, and entrepreneurship to coalesce so that it can happen. But one of the questions that I think inevitably arises is, okay, there was always going to be this imbalance, perhaps, between the Americas, Silicon Valley, and the Silicon Valleys of other parts of the world, as long as there was such a concentration of internet users and technology in America. But with the next billion people coming online, all of a sudden you really do genuinely have this huge user base, this incredible reach and spread of technology in other parts of the world, and therefore the question inevitably arises, okay, are things now gonna start changing? Uh, and what kinds of startups are going to be taking advantage of these markets, and what kinds of investors are going to be going in there, and what kinds of money are they going to make, and what sorts of changes are going to happen, are going to have to happen uh, in terms of local legislation and uh, financing structures for this, for this to all take off. So um, we have two very interesting panelists to talk to us about the whole question of global startups. Christopher Schroeder is uh, a, an entrepreneur, a venture investor, and he's the author of a book, Startup Rising, which is about the entrepreneurial revolution in the modern Middle East. Um, and Jalak Joban Putra has just started, just raising her own fund at Future Perfect Ventures, um, and she was uh, born and raised in, born in Nairobi, I believe, raised in the U.S., um, and has worked at a number of uh, organizations doing uh, entrepreneurship around the world. So um, I'm very glad that you're both here with us. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. And I thought we might just begin with this, this question. Okay, so next billion, what kinds of startups are you seeing in different parts of the world that you think are going to take advantage of this, of this emerging mass of, of internet users? Uh, and how are, the, how are the business models or the approaches that they are taking different from what we might be used to seeing over here? Sure. Uh what, what I found fascinating over, you know, the last five, six years that we've seen really, you know, mobile use become more and more ubiquitous um, is the innovative models that have emerged, you know, outside of the developed world. So, um, you know, in, in a lot of the emerging markets, they're not uh, using credit cards, right? And, and so um, now to get around that on the e-commerce side, uh, there's a whole kind of cash on delivery system that, that's been set up, uh, set up and that works really well. Um, there, uh, there's a lot of credits or alternatives to uh, what we consider credit scoring. Uh, here in uh, the U.S. Uh, because most of the world is still unbanked and, and we're leapfrogging, you know, the traditional bank. Um, and, and so uh, companies are using mobile phone data to build credit history uh, for folks so then they can uh, offer loan products. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, you know, of course, there's a story of um, M-Pesa in, in Nairobi where uh, I think Christopher was saying that 20% you know, of, of the GDP of Kenya is, is now uh, 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 going through the M-Pesa mobile money system. And, you know, here we are in the U.S. still trying to figure out um, how mobile payments is going to work uh, because we have existing infrastructure. Structures. So um, I, I think, you know, increasingly we're going to be able to look to the developing world or, you know, uh, fast uh, developing world for, uh, for solutions. Um, and healthcare is another area that, you know, um, uh, certainly there's a lot happening. Right. So, that, I mean, that sounds like, you know, I don't want to get too much into this topic of the panel that's going to talk about digital finance, but it sounds like a potential you know, this is an area that investors should be interested in from the West as well, right? I mean, anything involving finance is big money. Um, but is, where is the money coming from for startups that are doing that kind of, that kind of mobile banking? Or is it, is it all coming from the telecoms companies? Yeah, well, in, in Nairobi specifically, um, it was really a Safaricom uh, and, and bank joint venture. Um, and, and so, you know, that's used as an example of how it's not necessarily a replicable in, in other uh, places that may not have a telecom monopoly. Um, but, you know, look, at the end of the day, it's even investing in financial services in the U.S., which I've been doing um, for a number of years, there's a lot of regulation um, uh, that you have to pay attention to. Um, and, and and so 
you do need local market knowledge, um, and 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 so that's one of the reasons we don't necessarily see um, you know uh, uh, investors outside of the region investing in some right. of these companies. Christopher, what sort of I mean, interesting things have you seen that are, that really mark out the startup scene as different? So, I mean, I, I think that first of all, just the idea that this is happening at such scale in emerging markets generally, but particularly in my case, in a place like the Arab world, where we in the West have one narrative about what's going on there. We can't get our minds around what it really means that, that places where we think of from CNN is all about political instability and complexity are, are building things. And I think the second narrative bias that we have is that we tend to look for always the bright, shiny new thing as innovation, mm -hmm. forgetting that in many societies that merely the access to things which we in the West have taken for granted at some points uh, is innovation, actually is innovation as defined by there. And so you know, I mean, just to give you a sense of the scale of what's happening now and where I think it's going overall. If I were to tell you that the largest per capita consumer of YouTube on Earth was Saudi Arabia, would you be surprised? Would you be surprised to know that the largest demographic of those viewers are women? Mm -hmm. Would you be even more surprised to know that the largest plurality of content are watching is education? To self-teach, to get basic skills, to think about how to use basic technology in ways that can solve problems. And then for we in the West, there are two phenomena that become so important in a place like the Middle East, but I think across emerging markets. One is there will be advantages in the experience, like mobile, because in the place of the Middle East, they've never known landlines. So there will be real innovation of a kind of a global scale that comes from that. There's a lot of sun there. There's going to be real innovation in places like solar technology and desalinization. But the thing that we really miss in our narrative so much is that these are large and growing markets that are huge in and of themselves. Our narrative in the last 10 years is if you're going to make it, you have to make it in America. In the next 10 years, making it in America is going to be a big thing. But all of a sudden now, we're talking about billions of peoples and markets that have innovation on their own terms and ways that we can co-author arrangements, which I think is going to change the dynamic profoundly. Right. Um, so earlier in this conference, Nathan Eagle of Jana said something which uh, I know some people interpreted as a rebuke to Eric Schmidt of Google. Um, and he basically said... Um, there is this attitude in Silicon Valley, uh, I'm paraphrasing, he said there's this attitude in Silicon Valley that it's really important to get uh, internet access to the rest of the world, that everyone deserves to have a voice, um, but that you can't really make any money out of them. You know, they're, they're, these are poor people and they're, they're not monetizable. Um, and he said, you know, that's a very, um, you know, choose your, ad, use your adjective of choice to describe that attitude. But <clears throat> there is this attitude, it feels to me, in, in, in Silicon Valley that, um, sure, big markets, everything, but, you know, very low returns, can't make money, nobody has made any money, no really big exits have come out of there. Uh, I mean, do you think that's, that attitude is still justified? No, I don't think it's justified at all. I mean, first of all, it, it's depending on what you mean by big exits and where. So even in the Arab world, the Yahoo of the Middle East exited for $200 million just a little bit less not too long ago. If anyone doesn't think that Baidu or shortly Alibaba or Yandex or Mercado Libre are not big exits, I don't know what proportion by which they're judging it. So to me, that's just silly. I think that, that in Silicon Valley and in U.S. investors in generally, there are two fundamental choices you can make, right? One is that you really have an expertise here and you want to drive it at a higher cost. So for example, when I interviewed AT&T for my book, they said, look, we're never going to make it big in emerging markets because our strategy is effectively a $75 ARPU strategy, and that's fine by us. But obviously, people in India are making billions of dollars at a $9 ARPU strategy. So you can make, like, I don't know what the hell iPhone is thinking about having an emerging market strategy with $300 phones. I mean, I just doesn't, I guess what they're saying at the end of the day, we will only deal with the elite, whatever that means. But Sounds if you like realize it. that in a world of 5 billion smartphones, that all of a sudden, if you can make a penny on each, something really, really interesting and powerful can happen. You just have to make a choice about whether or not you have the expertise or can partner with the expertise to engage in markets on their terms yeah. or whether or not you just sort of say to yourself, at the end of the day, I want to stay focused on what I do normally. But to say one is dismissive of the other, to me, makes no sense at all. Yeah, and I mean, you touched on, on the scale. There's the scale issue. And it's not only about uh, first getting into... Uh, you know, getting a cheap phone into some of these people's hands. But it, once they're on it and once they start using it, they're going to spend money um, on the platform, on the phone. Um, I mean, I use the example of uh, farmers in, mm -hmm. in Africa, right? Um, 
they don't make a lot, but they will spend a good proportion of their income, and they view it as an investment, um, you know, on their mobile connectivity, on their phone, uh, because they know that they're going to be able to make more money down the road from that connectivity. And I think that's like a mentality that a lot of investors and, and entrepreneurs here don't understand. And unless you've been on the ground and talking to these people and seeing how they're using this and, and how they're thinking of um, of all of this, uh, you're going to miss out on it. Well, I mean, so to cite Nathan Eagle again, he mentioned this, this figure that in some parts, I think, of Africa, he was saying people spend 10% of their income on, air, on airtime and on top-ups, and that this is, you know, what companies advertise in rural villages. And I, there, it seems to me there are two ways to see that. One is, um, oh, my God, that's terrible. People have got to spend this much money um, in order to get access. On the other hand, it's wonderful that they want it that much, and that, that shows you what the demand is. But, you know, another, yes, another way to view that is to say, well, 10% of their income is the best that you're ever going to get, because as their incomes rise, they're going to be, and services improve, you know, that spend is going to go down. Well, I think that, that's a very <clears throat> limited view of, yeah. of, of what the potential is. And, you know, I uh, more power to them because that provides opportunity for those of us that, that see the potential. But, um, you know, when people have it, when there's so much pent-up demand uh, for services, for connectivity, for livelihood, you cannot kind of stop that momentum. And, and um you know, it's about figuring out what they're going to spend on next, right? And and um, and here we're pretty tapped out, I'd say, in in the developed world on on ARPU and uh, and uh, we're you know companies are really going to have to start looking to these markets. I think the mistake that a lot of people make is twofold. One is that they think of mobile devices, particularly smartphones, as fancy featured phones. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. and I think that, by the way, when the book is written on RIM, I think that's going to be the essence of their demise where they just don't realize at the end of the day that these are accretive supercomputers that allow people to do other things with their life. So you can say they're spending 10% off of a low income now, but they're using it not just for voice, they're using it to solve all sorts of problems in their backyard. And if the denominator keeps increasing, as statistically and palpably it, it is in emerging markets and rising middle classes anywhere, that 10%, even if it becomes 7%, becomes a really interesting number over time. People right. view it as a static thing, which makes no sense to me. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what I started with, which is that question of, okay, where are the Silicon Valleys of the future? I mean, is it, is it, is it this naive hope to imagine that for, for countries that keep on trying to create them? I mean, I, I lived in Israel, which was probably one of the few examples of a place that really did create its own That's Silicon true. Valley, and it, it did it for a variety of very local to Israel factors. Uh, I lived in Russia where they tried to create a Silicon Valley from scratch right, right outside Moscow. And I went to visit the field where they were going to build it. And, you know, it was going to be like Soviet central planning all over again. And, of course, it went nowhere. But, uh, and then people talk about Berlin and Silicon Alley. And there's a, silicon, you know, there's a startup scene in Warsaw. And everywhere has got its attempt. But is any of these going anywhere? Uh, look, I, I think that, that what I have found, at least in my uh, work in the Arab world, is that geography matters and ecosystems of talent network effects of success breeding success matter. But, you know, Silicon Valley is like Florence, Italy, or, or Cordoba, a thousand years. I mean, it's a unique feature. And we are animals who like to drive by side view mirrors sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I think we miss the phenomenon that is happening in this diaspora of technology, which is two things. One, the phenomenon is much more bottom up. In, in the Arab world, it has stunned me how many of the ecosystems are being built bottom up. Mm -hmm. not top-down in that traditional sense, which may have limitations at one point, but it begs then a second point, which is maybe we're talking not about a world of where is the next Silicon Valley, but there are going to be hubs of Silicon Valley all over the world because of the ubiquitous access to this kind of capability and technology. So I'm not saying ecosystems don't matter. Governance, rule of law matters. Great educational institutions matter. But when you're in a world where all of a sudden millions of people are using Coursera, mm -hmm. how we define what is an educational institution will evolve. And I think looking for the next Silicon Valley, which I get asked all the time, is kind of looking back the last 10 years as opposed to looking in the potential over the next 10. That's interesting. So you think that the whole the ecosystem of how technology is created and nurtured and grown is, is itself going to change? It has to. It doesn't mean that you have to throw out, you know, that everything that's worked before won't be important going forward. That would mm -hmm. be silly. Rule of law really matters. The barriers that I've seen in the Arab world just because of basic ability to move goods and services from one country to another is crazy mm -hmm. by any standard, right? So that stuff matters. But I think the more interesting question is now with the ubiquitous access of software that works, 
and a new generation of people who think of most problems, even infrastructure problems, as software problems, there are going to be new attributes that we should be looking at in that direction as opposed to, is it going to look like what Silicon Valley looked like eight years ago? Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, uh, we talk about how uh, technology and the Internet has decentralized a lot of things. I think it's also decentralizing innovation and, and what's possible. Um, and, and so, you know, it, it behooves Silicon Valley to think that they're going to stay intact the way they are, um, you know, forever. But, but there's innovation happening everywhere. Right. right now. Angelica, I'm going to let you talk your book a little bit. Um, you, you're setting up this fund now, and it's, it's uh, geography neutral, as I understand it, right? Or how, how are you approaching it? Yeah, so it, it's uh, based here in New York, and I, I think New York is a, a, a great spot uh, to be investing out of because we're building, you know, uh, we're, we're getting more and more technical talent here. It's geographically, you know, I think more central to a lot of other regions than, than the Valley is. Um, and it's all about uh, next generation data analytics, and we're calling it interpretive intelligence. So, um, and the emerging uh, you know, the emerging markets play a big role in this because a lot of the data that's going to be created in the future is going to be created uh, in, in these emerging markets. And so mm. it's about combining all of that data in healthcare and in, in education, uh, in commerce, and coming up with solutions uh, that uh, not only benefit businesses, which we've seen a lot of, but benefit individuals. And too. is that data going to be coming from people's devices? How, where is that data coming um, from? It's going to, yeah, I mean, it, it's offline, online. Um, yeah. You know, uh, we are seeing more and more smartphones, but they're going to be more connected devices, uh, machine to machine data. And, um, but, you know, data in itself doesn't do anything. Um, and, uh, and it especially doesn't do anything for individuals that are creating it unless there's kind of some smart analytics and, um, and truly making that technology and data seamless with our lives. And, and that, that's the goal, is to make it work for us. Okay. I'd like to ask each of you, which is the most interesting, peculiar startup scene that we've never heard of? <laughs> oh, sorry. Make me answer that. Oh, gosh. I mean, is there, is there one place that you have been where you just saw a kind of interesting hub of activity um, or, or people going about? I mean, you know, speaking to what Christopher said about how the, the shape of the ecosystem changes, is, is altering. Is there any, any place in particular that kind of makes you think about this is how things might be done? Well, I mean, there, there are two places uh, that I've been that you wouldn't think of as innovation hubs. Um, and, you know, one is uh, the Congo, the Democratic Republic of Congo. But I was in I was in Rwanda a few years ago and I just decided to take a car over to, the, um, you know, over the border and, and see kind of what was happening on the ground there. And. Um, you know, there are all sorts of hacks that people come up with to communicate. I mean, there wasn't, you know, any any sort of uh, a reliable communication mechanism. But, um, you know, this this guy who owned a restaurant uh, took me into the back room and said, you know, I can I can figure out how to get onto the Internet. And and so I, I think like the less resources people have, the more innovative they actually can be. And I think that's why we really need to look at some of these um, places that have been more resource constrained. Um, at, you know, as we become more resource constrained, we can probably learn a lot from what they've hacked together. And, and um, you know, the other place is uh, Myanmar, um, when, uh, you know, before they opened up in 07, it was the same thing. And, and it goes back to spend on mobile devices. Um, you know, I had a tour guide there who was a college student, and it cost over $1,000 to buy a regular feature phone at that time, and, and there was no guarantee of connectivity, but he still knew that would help him, um, you know, grow his business, and, and so he invested in it. So, um, you know, I think we have to turn our thinking on our Look, uh, you, 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 you still, it's almost like, the, where's the next Silicon Valley? You like geography, and I get why. <laughs> but I have to tell you, the story of our time is where there is growing ubiquitous access of technology, there's amazing problem solving and innovation in odd corners. So I'll leave you two very, very quick examples of the winner of the Arab high school startup competition a year ago were these five amazing young women who built solar charging stations for tent communities so they could come in and charge uh, lights to get out of the kerosene business. These were five young high school women who found out how to build solar panels by going on YouTube and the internet in Yemen. Mm -hmm. 
the last startup weekend, which a lot of you guys have been to, you know about, the last major startup weekend was in Gaza. 250 mm-hmm. young entrepreneurs. Right. So the story of our time is where there's ubiquitous access and growing access to technology, there you will find this happening. And what were they building in Gaza? What kinds of... Everything. So you, you have a lot of it would be, as you pointed out, local problem solving just in terms of moving goods and services and that kind of stuff. But these kids are dreamers. They've got mm-hmm. e-commerce platforms about how they'd like to take uh, crafts and things from where they have and move them forward. And we have other people who are like global players thinking about how they could compete in things like uh, travel and booking. Uh, one of the largest startups in travel and booking, not quite like Expedia, more like maybe TripAdvisor, uh, is in Ramallah, mm-hmm. East Jerusalem, uh, not Gaza. But it just gives you a sense that where there's that opportunity, where people can see what else is out there, they begin to dream not only local problem solving where it often starts, but how they can get one click away to almost anyone. Right. I wonder if I might actually come back to Myanmar, which you just mentioned, because it's it's such a striking place because it really is almost the blank slate, right? Mm-hmm. The price of a SIM card there came down from something like $3,000 a few years ago to I think it's now actually zero. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, the, you know, the telecoms networks are being built out. Everyone is flooding to Myanmar. Um, there was a, I don't remember which tech conference it was, but there was a tech conference bar camp or something with, you know, 4,500 attendees a few months ago. Wow. And, uh, so it's crazy. But what when you, when you have a country that is really almost starting from zero, that what does it, look like? I mean, what do you expect coming out of that? Well, I mean, it's not really starting from zero in terms of the human capital, right? right? And, and, uh, and going back to the, um, <clears throat> the pent-up demand and that desire for connectivity, you know, I, I went there and I traveled around, I hitchhiked, <laughs> and, and, and the conversations I had, I mean, you could tell these people just were hungry to connect, mm-hmm. right? And, and so I, I think it's going to be really powerful. Now, you know, obviously, um, People need to be trained in, in, you know, software development and other skills. And, and I, I do hope that other than just the infrastructure building um, and, and the large companies, I hope that the rest of the world comes in and, and you know, thinks about that educational piece and, that, um, and really helping harness this entrepreneurial talent that already exists there. Right. So. What you said just now actually about people in Saudi Arabia using YouTube for, for education really struck me because I thought everyone was using it for music videos. Well, there's that too. Right. <laughs> and and, and uh, soap operas and like everything. People are people. But, mm-hmm. but when you have an opportunity all of a sudden to be able to access things that you could not before, that you know if you utilize it, you can be something. Right. It's a psychological change as much as a yeah. substantive one. Your mention of that, by the way, was also interesting because one of the aspects that I know is, is the case in some countries is the imbalance of uh, men to women in technology that we often see here, I think is, well, it may not be less pronounced, but there, at least there are certain areas where women have a particular, I don't know if advantage is the right word, but can you talk a little bit about that? So the economist uh, this summer had a report, you never know in nascent markets how good the data is, but anecdotally I can confirm it was always the case, that a third of the tech startups in the Arab world are women. Mm-hmm. And I can tell you I was a judge at an MIT startup competition in Lebanon a year and a half ago, uh, 6,000 companies, 15,000 entrepreneurs, 41% of them were women. Mm-hmm. And when I interviewed a lot of women um, entrepreneurs, you get a whole spectrum of why they do what they do and all. But they kind of fell down in one, two buckets. The first were women who literally just got up into my grid and said, do not put me in your chapter about women entrepreneurs. I'm so tired <laughs> of you gringos thinking about this is like that. Spe- I'm an entrepreneur. I want to talk about my company and so on. But then you talk to other women who are building e-commerce platforms, and Saudi Arabia is a place where they need to do business, and they can't drive. Yep. And so you have a continuum. But you know, you in the audience know, and you all know very well, the definition of a great entrepreneur is someone who works around problems. And to a person, the women that I met said, we're very good at working around problems. So it's right. not a surprise to me that, that there are such leaders in this ecosystem. And I, I also have to say, uh, we were talking about Jordan uh, uh, backstage earlier, and, and when I was there about a year ago uh, in, in the Oasis Incubator Accelerator, um, half of uh, the participants were women. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, that's a better ratio than you see at, in accelerators here in the U.S. And, and they were shocked that that's not the case in, in, uh, in, in the U.S. And I, I think in some of those regions, you have such high unemployment rates, uh, you have, and, and you have these uh, large youth populations. And so they just go out and solve for problems um, and, and build companies, and they don't really think twice about it. Um, they just al- do it. Is there also a phenomenon that 
because men have dominated so many professions, there are the new professions don't have that 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 existing dominance, and so it's easier for for, for women to come into them. Or is it that then almost they're not seen as men's professions? I don't know. I mean, it's sort of. No, I think I think it's challenging. I mean, it's, I mean, I spoke to many in India or you know even in the Middle East that certainly do have challenges with doing so. So I, I don't think we can uh, underestimate that they have challenges, but uh, they just they don't they don't view constraints. You know, they've lived with constraints and see a little opening and then they go for it. And and I think that's a big difference. Right. Um, there's, there's neither of you is particularly uh, connected to China, I know. So this may be a silly question, but you know, where are we going to see? You, you mentioned Alibaba, you mentioned um, Kamala, uh, Kamala, like that. So, but where are we going to see the next Instagram or Tumblr come out of? Is it going to be somewhere else? You know, it's very interesting. If we had this meeting certainly 20 years ago, maybe even 15 years ago. The idea that great consumer electronics or great mobile manufacturers would be in places like Korea and Japan and Finland, God knows, would not have been on our radar really at all. And yet, obviously, they've become massive global players in our lives. There hasn't been yet a great global software, I would suggest. Mm -hmm. I, I can't think of one. Maybe you can name one, and maybe there's something in the enterprise side that you can make an argument. But when you're talking about things like Instagram or Facebook, these massive Google, mass-adopted global English language things, uh, it hasn't happened yet, but I don't see any reason why, with the barriers so low in innovation and access to technology, that two things, one of two things can happen, or both. One is that we will be seeing amazing software innovation at global scale from places that surprise us. And it's secondly, to what I said before, maybe who cares? Because if they're doing great in multi-billion dollar markets that are not us, that's still an unbelievable you know, phenomenon in and of itself. Right. We're almost out of time, so maybe I'll just ask you to each to say very briefly, is there one company that you've seen um, and that you feel like talking about that you think we don't know about and but could be big? Maybe not the next Instagram, but certainly big. Um, well, there, there's a company that I've been looking at, and I spent a lot of time looking at the adaptive learning and artificial intelligence space. And mm -hmm. um, I do think... Um, you know, new generation collaboration is, is really interesting, and especially when it can start to traverse uh, companies as well as geographic boundaries. And I'm, I'm seeing us really kind of get there. Um, and, and so, I mean, you know, I know that's vague, but I'm not going to reveal who the that's, company is. I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect it to. <laughs> you know, there, there are a couple of e-commerce players, as often the case in emerging markets. Souk.com, which is a bit like the Amazon of the Middle East, which is probably, I don't know their numbers, but probably a multi-hundred million dollar business right now, mm. is just going gangbusters. And I think they're great to watch. There's an earlier stage, but an amazing company run by a great young entrepreneur called Jamalon, which is uh, like books, and it's also blowing its numbers out, but at a smaller scale. But I, I just love these problem solvers that I see on the ground that are doing things that were you know, never there before and just solving their problems. And I'm particularly intrigued by like a company called Nafham, which is an, it's sort of like a Khan Academy of the Middle East out of, out of Egypt. Mm -hmm. And within six months, it had 10,000 math and writing and reading videos uploaded to its platform, and wow. millions have actually already accessed it. So there's just, there's just a lot of interesting stuff going on at the same time that there are really tough things that are going on as well. Mm -hmm. And it's just a matter of balancing out both. Good. Well, I hope you've written down all those URLs. Jalak, Christopher, thank you very, very much. Thank you for thank having you. us. Thank you.